Ampetuki, Lila Washte, Wachi Ankapolo, James Rowling Leafy, Machapi, Na Hesapa Ki, Yanka Ochanku, Namataha, Na Iuha Chante, Na Pechi Zapolo. I greet you with a good heart and a handshake. My name is James Rowling Leaf. I'm from the Rosebridge Sioux Tribe. I'm coming to you from the Black Hills of South Dakota, USA, and I um, welcome you uh, to the 2020 Indigenous Geo Summit. We're on day three, believe it or not, and it's great that you're with us today. Uh, greetings to the to the world, and thank you for coming. And as in our ways, um, in particular Lakota ways, our cultural ways, we always begin our day in preparation for the day ahead. And it's important that we call upon our elders and our, our spiritual leaders to help us with this. And so we have uh, prayers, we have ceremonies, we have practices that help us think about the day, think about uh, our needs, and think about our communities today. So I have the great honor, the great honor and privilege to um, welcome Ripo the Kakokwai, some brutal elder to give us our blessing. And as I understand it, his blessing will focus on asking God to help us uh, for unity and peace as we deal with the great changes in our world. So with that, um, I'm gonna ask our, I'll call upon our elder to give us our welcome blessing. Please play the video. <laughs> James. Thank you, uh, Ripo, for that wonderful introduction and to help us begin in a good way. Um, you know, we are here in the education, workforce, inter intergenerational knowledge transfer um, section program today. And we're happy that um, you're here with us. Uh, as the Geo Indigenous Alliance was preparing, um, for this work and for this summit, we all recognize the importance of education and how we prepare our indigenous youth to uh, become leaders in our community to use the earth observations. So today's uh, today's session is gonna highlight, it's gonna go a little bit deeper into how programs, how people are using and preparing our, our young people for uh, those opportunities. And so uh, as we get ready uh, for our speakers, I also wanna remind, remind you as participants to use Slido Slido is where we'll be um, taking questions from you. So it's slido.com 
uh, key word is Geo Indigenous Summit. Geo Indigenous Summit. So uh, with that, let's let's begin. Um, we're going to start with uh, with Miss Cindy Schmidt. Uh, I know Cindy, and it's a pleasure to have her with us today. Uh, Cindy Schmidt is Associate Program Manager for NASA Earth Science Applied Science Ecological Forecasting Program. Uh, the, the title of her talk is uh, Virtual Capacity Building with Indigenous Communities and NASA. So please share Cindy's video. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I will be telling you a little bit about an initiative within NASA's Capacity Building Program that focuses on Indigenous peoples. My goal with this presentation is to not only tell you what we are doing, but also to provide you with information about where you can go to build your geospatial skills. Before I get into this presentation, just a little bit of background on me. I've been at NASA for a very long time and have always been involved with using remote sensing for a variety of applications, including urban growth, forestry, agriculture, and public health. I've taught remote sensing for over 15 years at local universities and community colleges and was also a trainer for NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program for several years. In addition to this initiative, I'm also an Associate Program Manager for NASA's Ecological Forecasting Program. So you may ask yourself, why is NASA involved in Earth Science and Capacity Building for Indigenous Peoples? The answer is because NASA has launched many Earth observing satellites to study the atmosphere, oceans, and land, and will continue to do so in the future. Although many of these satellites are mostly used for research, NASA's Applied Sciences Program develops tools, models, and maps to improve decision making in the areas of species conservation, disaster management, public health and air quality, and water management. With this initiative, my colleague Amber McCollum and I seek to build the capacity of indigenous peoples to use satellite Earth observations to monitor and manage their natural resources. And we do this in a variety of ways. This image shows how satellite imagery is being used to help the Navajo Nation monitor drought. We primarily focus on co-developing place-based in-person training workshops with tribal communities around the United States. These workshops are all developed around issues that are important to the tribes in those regions. These are examples of some of the locations of, of some of our workshops, including the, the Northwest Indian College in Washington, the Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute in New Mexico, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, home of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Geospatial Office in Colorado. These trainings are typically two to three days and involve hands-on exercises using whatever geospatial software the tribe has. However, once COVID hit this year, we, of course, could no longer do our in-person workshops. So we decided to put all our materials online to make them freely available to anyone. We collaborated with the United Tribes Technical College, located in North Dakota, to offer this four-week training course, as well as offer continuing education credits for any interested participants in the United States. This course was offered live through the month of October, but the recordings and all associated materials are freely available at the website listed here. You can see the topics listed here, including an introduction to remote sensing, land cover classification, change detection and time series, and remote sensing web tools. Each session includes a lecture and a hands-on exercise. We used ArcGIS Pro in all of our exercises, but we've also made the exercises available in QGIS and ArcGIS Desktop. At the beginning of each week's lecture, we also provided short presentations from various tribes around the nation on how they were using remote sensing. These included an overview of the Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool, 
land cover applications and tribal wildlife management from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, some mapping applications presented by James Radlingley from the Rosebud Sioux tribe, and a great story about reclaiming a river from Talon Arbuckle of the Tulalip tribe in Washington state. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about the indigenous mapping workshop that occurred in November. This workshop was organized by the, by the indigenous led and owned Firelight Group in Canada and featured many of the training sessions on the use of geospatial technology for indigenous peoples. Amber and I offered nine different trainings on the use of remote sensing for land management. Since this was a virtual conference, everything was recorded and available here at the website. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Cindy, uh, could you turn on your camera, please? There she is. Hello. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy, for uh, that pre wonderful presentation. You know, I, um, I had a question for you. And again, uh, you, let's please use Slido for additional questions for our presenters. Uh, Cindy, these last few days, you know, we heard from a number of different speakers from all over the world, both uh, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous. And it seems like there's a common theme in a lot of this, a lot of the talk and a lot of presentation is, is uh, the, the term capacity building. And I was, again, I was wondering, um, uh, you know, could you, uh, again, uh, go a little bit deeper in terms of, you know, how you think about or how we need to think about capacity building and maybe share some examples of um, of how you see it or um, things that maybe the Geo Indigenous Alliance can can be a part of or support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I must say, in the in the four four years, I guess I've been working on this particular initiative, um, capacity building for Indigenous peoples. I've learned a lot about um mm -hmm. how how to most effectively go about building the capacity of indigenous peoples to use these technologies um both inside and outside the US um and and one really important <clears throat> component of that that I've learned is one the co-development of those um of those capacity building act activities so working closely with the communities or the organizations um, to to really fully understand what the needs are first of all, um, and then um, you know what the skill set is, um, so we can build those activities around that. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm I'm really excited about is partnering with the um, Indigenous Mapping Workshop. So hopefully Steve DeRoy will be joining us um, and and giving a talk um, and <clears throat> and learning really how to. Um, bring this technology to communities that maybe um, are a little more remote, um, or how do we bring in indigenous knowledge into our training better? Um, that's mm. that's one thing I'm really trying to sort of get better at and really understand how to do that um, really well. So that's kind of it in a in a in a nutshell, James. And I also want to mention um, that um, we have a large capacity building program at NASA. Um, and Anna Prados will be giving a talk a little bit later about um, the RSET program. So that's just a whole nother set of tools beyond what what um, I'm able to do that's available to um, the indigenous community as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Cindy. I know that uh, there's uh, there's been requests and interest from the U URLs for the training that you shared as well. So. Um, Let's figure out how we can share that, you know, whether through the okay. Digis Alliance or through your program, but let's make sure our participants get access to that. Absolutely. You know, I had a follow-up question as well, uh, Cindy, you know, uh, you know, the Geo Indigenous Alliance, you know, when we uh, began to work to develop this, this big idea, uh, NASA was one of the key um, supporters of that work. And that's how you and I, um, we got reconnected and how you brought me into this, uh, uh, digital, digital Alliance work, and so uh, what can you tell us uh, maybe with this new administration? I'm not going to get too political, but but I'm wondering <laughs> with the, with this new administration, you know, do you see more opportunities for NASA to really begin to work, you know, with indigenous people, not just uh, in America, but around the world? Uh, is there any kind of indication that what that might have look like? Yeah, I, I would say that it's hard to tell right now um, to, to, to answer that question. I would say, you know, NASA is heavily involved in GEO. 
um, and yeah. very supportive of the work that the Alliance um, is doing, not just as GEO, but also USGO and AmeriGEO as well. So we're really trying to build um, indigenous presence and um, and participation in all of those um, geo as a organization as a whole, but also the regional organizations USGO and AmeriGEO. So I definitely see NASA really trying to support some of those efforts a lot more, especially in the area of capacity building. But um, it'll it remains to be seen <laughs> okay. how the next administration <laughs> will will okay. sort of impact our our. Um, our ability to work with indigenous peoples. I hope it continues and grows, James. I really do. You know, I'm going to keep keep asking here. Um, so, you know, we have you mentioned these regional geos around the world. Uh, do you see uh, much interaction, uh, much partnership, uh, collaboration, coordination among the regional geos to sort of share, like you talked about, capacity building, education, trainings? Do you see that? Is that part of the the model, or do we need to? encourage that kind of model so that you know we're working closer together in terms of the regional geos yeah i i really think that could be a role of the um the alliance um is helping to bridge um you know and, and to to provide common activities across all the different geo activities so that they're linked to each other um you know certainly AmeriGEO will have its own trainings, and just to let everyone know, there will be a couple trainings um, coming up through AmeriGEO focused on the Americas, so they will, they will be offered in English and Spanish. And, um, and, but of course, all of those will be advertised through all, through, uh, through the GEO um, portal as well. Um, USGO, you know, we're really trying hard to really, and, and James, I know you're involved, you will be involved with this, is, is really trying to bring um, the tribal voice, the US tribal voice to um, the USGO uh, leadership as well. So it'll take some time, but I think the Alliance can really help um, foster that relationship. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Cindy, and uh, thank you again for your support and the support of NASA and all your your team. It's been great to work with you, and we look forward to the future and how we continue to build a capacity among our indigenous people. Thank you, James. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna move keep moving along here. Uh, our, our next uh, presenter will be uh, Candice Pedersen Salavni Salavanek Salavanek. Uh, who is a, a, it was a, a young Inuk who grew up in Nunavut. She has been working with the government of Nunavut and the federal government of Canada. The title of her talk is SIKU, SKU, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network and Mapping Platform. So with that, please play Candace's video, Rick. Thank you. <laughs> Siku, the Inuktitut word for sea ice, connects communities across the Arctic. Siku, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network. Siku is a mobile app and web platform created by and for Inuit, providing tools for weather, ice safety, and hunting stories, as well as knowledge transfer and language preservation. The weather's changing, the ice conditions are changing. In one way, driving a snowmobile or walking, we have to think before we get on that ice. So this one's no good. If you try to pass by through this, you'll lose your snowmobile. Siku puts indigenous knowledge and observations front and center alongside weather and safety services, including sea ice products, tides, marine forecast, and satellite imagery. This lets hunters share dangerous and changing conditions with their communities using their own language and knowledge systems. We used to get our information on five different websites. Now with Siku, all that information is one place, also with the information from the elders and hunters. Siku includes profiles for wildlife, sea ice, and traditional place names in multiple dialects that are taggable and act as living wikis of indigenous knowledge. Using the mobile app while you're on the land, posts such as hunting stories and GPS tracks can be recorded and uploaded to Siku when you are back in your community. Oral history has been a big part of the Inuit tradition. Nothing was written, so everybody 
just had a good memory. Now, with the Chico, we are providing uh, new ways how the Inuit knowledge and science can work together. Siku helps you document the data that has always formed the basis of indigenous knowledge and mobilize it for use in community-based monitoring, guardian programs, and self-determination in research and environmental stewardship. With Siku, we get to decide how we share our knowledge. Siku is a safe place to share our hunting stories. As the only social media platform putting indigenous rights first, Siku includes privacy settings tailored specifically for indigenous knowledge ensuring that no one can use your data without permission. You become a hunter because you keep practicing and you follow and you let the elders take the lead. You still need your harpoon to stay safe on the ice. And now with Siku, you can mobilize your knowledge, connecting hunters, elders and youth for the benefit of future generations. I think Inuit clothing, the feathers that we use and traditional tools combined with technology and the tools of today's modern youth and you put them together it would be amazing integrating indigenous ways of knowing with a suite of modern technologies siku the indigenous knowledge social network now available for android iphone and online at siku.org brought to you by the arctic eider society hello from the siku team at the arctic eider society this time last year, we formally launched Siku at ArcticNet in Halifax, amazing audience and response. And we're really excited to share the progress of how Siku has been used since then. Since the launch, Siku has been featured in broad press coverage around the world. And most importantly, our usership across Inuit Nunanet has grown substantially to over 5,000 users. There are now more than 7,500 posts on Siku sharing trips, wildlife observations, hunting stories, dangerous ice posts, and a lot of content in social posts. When the world shut down in March 2020, airplanes were grounded and southern researchers stayed home. But the seal didn't stop coming up for air. The flow edge maintained its perpetual motion, and with innovative technology by and for Inuit, community-driven projects in places like Santa Kilobek, Nunavut, were not only able to continue, but thrive. Ikite, the Belcher Islands Archipelago Protected and Conserved Area, is being established by the community of Santa Kilowak in partnership with the Hikitani Inuit Association. Using CQ, the Indigenous Knowledge Social Network, local hunters, elders, and community members are gathering in-depth knowledge and observations during land use activities, crowdsourcing a resource inventory that will contribute to long-term stewardship of the region. Users maintained full access, ownership, and control over their data. Over 1,000 posts were made since January 2020 using the CQ mobile apps, setting new precedents for community engagement in research and monitoring. This success showcases CQ's ability to support and promote many kinds of unique, community-driven projects. Let's talk about how we did it. Through training videos and local coaching, over 100 community members, including women, men, elders, and youth, were supported to use the CQ mobile apps. A small honoraria contributed to their ability to hunt and bring back food during the pandemic. For example, with CQ, the community documented the harvest of nearly 5,000 fish over the course of more than 500 separate fishing trips, covering 25,000 kilometers. This documented the size of fish, presence of sicklebacks in their stomachs, and whether fish were from landlocked or sea-run populations. The case was similar for migratory birds, including geese and eiders, berries, invertebrates, and marine mammals like beluga and seal. Collectively, this contributed substantially to food security during the pandemic, provided full accountability of the funding and equitable distribution across the community, while allowing project managers to quantify their impact and the contribution of the project to the development of local conservation economies. Siku supports the self-determination of indigenous communities to run their own programs. Visit CQ.org to learn about how CQ can power your community-driven project. CQ was refined through workshops across Inuit Nunungat, with Inuit youth playing the leading role. The input from these workshops has made CQ into what it is today. We are still working on Siku, so please feel free to join our workshops or reach out with your ideas to make it better for Inuit too.
Well, that was great. I think we all need all we all need Sikus. Wow, that was great. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Cindy. Uh, Cindy, are you uh, are you on with us today? Candice couldn't make it today, but uh, I'm Joel, uh, executive director of okay. Riot Fighters. So, yeah. All right, Joel. Well, welcome. Thank you uh, for a great hat, by the way. I like that hat. How do we get one of those hats, by the way? Thank you. Sign up for CQ. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've got a few here. They're hard to ship in the mail, but yeah. Oh, you know, uh, a question for you uh, is that you know you're working with data. You're working with data, and you, you mentioned the different kinds of data that you're working with. Um, how did you guys approach uh, getting the community uh, to um, to support the idea of collecting data, uh, putting that data into devices or to different places? And uh, could, could you share about how that process looked like for, for you guys at Siku? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's being used across the new Nunungat right now, but in Santa Kilowak, um, where we're based, um, it's the app really came from there, from working together, and so. It started with um, five communities, Senekiluak, and uh, next door we have Anukshuak, Umirak, Kujarapik, uh, Inuit communities in Nunavik, and Shisasabi Cree community. And we were trying to understand the big picture of what was happening with climate and impacts of hydro projects. And each community had a piece of the puzzle, and we wanted to have a way to, you know, even though we're geographically distant, to be able to work together. And mm -hmm. so it kind of came from work, um, so we weren't just doing the same thing, but we could see in real time that we were working together and collaborate together across those distances and put those pieces of the puzzle together to get the big picture. Um, the other inspiration that really helped make this happen was one of our elders who just passed away last year, um, Peter Katuk. He was out at the flow edge every single day hunting seals and he was noticing things like the diets of seals changing from fish to more shrimp, potentially showing big ecosystem changes. And the response from academics when you share that knowledge was always that's really cool, but it's anecdotal, and mm. we need data. It's qualitative, and as Candice mentioned in the video, um, you know, uh, Inuit knowledge has been based on oral history. Scientists are excruciatingly good at writing things down, but Peter was out there every single day making observations, right? And so the mm. idea was people were posting on uh, groups on Facebook, but Facebook, you're giving away your intellectual property and you can't mobilize it. So we were like, if we can just take a picture every time. And we can tag the seal and we can tag the stomach contents, the fish, Haligaluk or king oak for shrimp. Um, then we'll have the data that's always been behind indigenous knowledge. And we can show mm -hmm. scientists the graph of our knowledge in the same way that they do kind of thing. And so that was the kind of inspiration. And uh, he was a pretty inspirational elder. So that helped a lot of people get on board. And then by training videos and ongoing engagement, we've been able to get so many people in Santa Kilowak involved, but also it helped them hunt, right? We, we have funding for Guardians pilot program for protected areas. And so uh, instead of bringing up researchers, we just had the whole community, right? And we pay a little bit of an honoraria that contributes to people's gas. So it allowed them to hunt and bring back food in the pandemic. And we crowdsourced the resource inventory at the same time. So that was pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, I'm just laughing because I'm, I'm so uh, impressed with what you're doing and and how you're doing this, and how you're putting all this different knowledge together and the people together. Another question for you. Uh, so, do you see? Uh, so, what's the future look like for CQ? Will you expand with other tribes, uh, other nations, other First Nations in in your work, or is there interest? Or how how can you know groups like ours support the work that you're doing or or want to do in the future? Yeah, well, so it's built to scale um, right from the beginning. So to add new wildlife species or new communities. Um, it's kind of built in that framework. And the core, one of the core concept is around indigenous environmental terminology. So with the ice terminology, you know, it's not just uh, words, right? This is the Inuit classification system for sea ice that relates to how people use ice, how animals use ice and, and the currents and that kind of thing. And those words are at risk of getting lost, but they're also the core concepts in Inuit, how you might have the Inuit knowledge system. And so by mobilizing them and allowing you to tag them, um, in posts and link it to satellite imagery and weather data and that it's helping empower that whole knowledge system. And so mm -hmm. in addition to scaling to new communities and regions, we want to add whole new thing, uh, dialects, cross-reference all the dialects. Right now we have a Nukutuk terminology for ice, wildlife mm -hmm. species, traditional place names. You want to add climate terms, weather terms, snow terms, wow. permafrost, and scale it up that way. Um, Cree are starting to use it in James Bay. 
And, uh, you know, we're, our plan is to scale in Canada for groups that want it, but we're also looking at Alaska, Greenland in the future. Um, any Indigenous groups that would like to benefit from the infrastructure that we've developed as a charity, we're happy to share and, and get you involved. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that was really outstanding. I really appreciate your work. And, and I think it's important that we as uh, Indigenous Alliance really track and pay attention to the work that's going on in the Canada in terms of the Indigenous uh, protected conservation areas. I'm, I'm becoming more aware of that work, Joel, and really good to hear uh, the CQ and how that's working there and also how it works with the youth. I really uh, like the Guardians program, by the way. Um, I'm aware of the Guardians program and how that's growing to be a national network to cover. So I think there's something mm -hmm. there that we need to look at uh, as Indigenous Alliance in terms of growing and supporting that network, how we get our young people involved with this work, how we support them, how we train them. And I think the economic development side of this is important as well. Is There's a good job here. Or it's a career here for our young people. So Absolutely. I want to thank you again, Joel. And let's stay in contact. Again, uh, uh, stay in contact with Joel. Um, if you want to support CQ, uh, please uh, reach out to him as well, and we'll work with you as well, Joel, going forward. So thank you very much today and your time. That'd be great. Thank you. Moving on to our next talk, uh, it's uh, Mr. Stephen DeRoy. Steve is from the Buffalo Clan, and he's Anishinaabe, Salto, and member of the Ebb and Flow First Nation from Manitoba. He is the co-founder and director and past president of the Firelight Group. Steve uh, founded the annual Indigenous Mapping Workshop, and the title of his talk is Indigenous Mapping Workshops. So, Rick, please play the video. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve DeRoy. I'm Anishinaabe from the Ebb and Flow First Nation, and I am really honored to be invited to participate in this conference. I'm going to be talking today about the Indigenous Mapping Workshop, and uh, I'll be talking about our roots and why we got started, as well as what are some of the outcomes. So uh, a little bit about myself. I'm from the Buffalo Clan. I'm a member of the Ebb and Flow First Nation, Lake Manitoba First Nations in Manitoba. I'm a cartographer by trade. And in 2010, I co-founded the Firelight Group. And in 2014, we began the Indigenous Mapping Workshops. So a little bit about the, our business. The Firelight Group is an Indigenous-owned company. We work for Indigenous communities only, and we equip staff with the necessary tools to be able to take this work on into the future. This shows our business areas, and our primary area of work is in the impact assessment realm, and we do a lot of work on documenting traditional knowledge and use information and uh, capturing that information using maps. So since 2010, the Firelight Group has completed over 250 traditional knowledge and use studies with Indigenous groups across the country, and this map shows where our work has uh, brought us. So in 2014, we decided to start the Indigenous Mapping Workshop with the Obviously, we wanted to train people how to create their own maps, but also tell stories through maps. And some of the goals for the Indigenous Mapping Workshop included creating a safe space for Indigenous people to share stories of the use of maps, data, and technologies, to increase spatial literacy by providing access to culturally relevant training, to expose Indigenous peoples to the wide variety of geospatial technologies and techniques, to advance Indigenous pedagogies of mapping and research methodologies, and to build a global community of Indigenous mappers. And since 2014, this is where our workshops have taken us across the globe. And the yellow icons represent the workshops we've done in both Turtle Island, as well as in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with our partners, uh, the Maori tribes in New Zealand, as well as with our Aboriginal partners in Australia. And the red dots indicate areas where we plan to have workshops, but with the pandemic, we're being a little bit flexible with that. So since 2014, this shows our timeline of workshops, where we've hosted them, uh, both here in North America, but also internationally. And, uh, and the Indigenous Mapping Workshop is an Indigenous-led initiative where we partner with Indigenous organizations and we really build a curriculum that's focused on uh, meeting the needs of Indigenous communities. And we work with our technology partners to then uh, deliver hands-on training. 
So that's what people get when they come to the workshop. They get hands-on technical training and networking opportunities. They get to have demonstrations of the tools and approaches. And then they get to hear presentations from uh, Indigenous experts on mapping and GIS technologies. In 2014, we were supposed to, or 2020, we were supposed to have a workshop in Regina, Saskatchewan. And obviously uh, with the pandemic, we had to shift gears. Um, our partners at the First Nations University of Canada still wanted to put on a workshop. And uh, so we decided to put on a virtual event where we used Mighty Networks and built an entire Indigenous Mapping Collective website that hosted all of the content uh, from the Indigenous Mapping workshops. And when we put the call out for people to uh, apply to attend, this was the response that we had. Uh, this map shows uh, the global map participants uh, uh, that wanted to attend the Indigenous Mapping Workshop. And we asked attendees about their skill level in areas such as web mapping, drones, GPS, GIS, remote sensing and programming. And you can see this is the, the responses from all of those applications. And the majority of responses are in the no experience to beginner level uh, of experience. So we realize that there is a strong need for uh, training and the level of impact that uh, that the lack of training prevents of Indigenous communities from achieving their mapping related objectives is shown here on this graph. Based on 84, 841 application responses, the majority of responses were from moderate to significant to severe impact. So we decided to build an entire curriculum uh, that focused on, on meeting those needs and it was a three day free virtual event that took place. And uh, we heard uh, panel presentations from leading experts on the issues of waste management, on lands management, on what's happening on the ground in Saskatchewan, but also talking about uh, data sovereignty and hearing from our technology partners on how mapping is taking place, uh, Indigenous mapping is taking place using their tools. And then we also provide hands-on training with our technology partners from Google, from NASA, from uh, Mapbox, and from Esri. And we heard about how people might be able to apply these tools to solve real-world problems. And it was great because we heard from those companies, though we also heard from open source companies such as Mapio, OpenStreetMap, Terra Stories and Digital Democracies from Native Lands. And the idea was to help people tell stories through maps and get a sense of how they might do that using these technologies. We had an interactive engagement session at the end that we heard from our participants of what they'd like to see moving forward. And in the end, uh, we had over uh, 120 scheduled Zoom meetings over three days, 11.75 hours of presentations from leading experts on Indigenous mapping, and 61 hands-on classes from our technology partners for a total of 45.75 training hours. In the end, we had 840 registered guests from 35 countries and six continents. Now, if you'd like to participate, uh, please join us in March for the 2021 IMW event and check out indigenousmaps.com for uh, more information about that. With that, I say chimi guach, and if you'd like to reach out here are my contact details, but enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for that great, great presentation on the Indigenous Mapping Workshop. I'm, I'm, I'm calling. Are you, are you with us, Steve, here? I'm looking at the, look at the screen here. Are you with us? Well, not hearing Steve, um, I, I just sort of wanted to, um, you know, make a, say a comment here. I know Cindy, you're on here. Let me put you on a spot a little bit because I know you were part of the this last um, Indigenous Mapping Workshop, and and maybe you can um, maybe you can help us uh, uh, with with this part of the question and answer with Steve. Um, I know that he gave a great great uh, great information about sort of the the uh, the potential impact of Indigenous mapping around the world with Indigenous people. Um, wh what do you think, or what's from your perspective? I know you're not Steve, but um, <laughs> You know how how do you how do you see this this collaboration, the model that he's created between open source and non open source, indigenous partners, um, non indigenous partners, you know from your perspective how do you see is that is that something that 
that we can learn from and and and, and scale that up to other kinds of uh, workings uh, with indigenous peoples? Yeah, I, I definitely think so, which is, you know, one of the reasons it's been my goal for several years to participate um, in that workshop and get to know Steve um, and his group, his Firelight group, because what they've done is really, I think, should be a model for how we how we move forward to build the capacity of indigenous peoples because because of the different levels of technologies that they use. Um, you know, all the way from sort of digital democracy has built an app that you can use on the ground, you know, on a phone without any internet co connectivity, um, all the way to, you know, the full blown, you need to download a satellite image and process it. You know, it's, it's, it's this whole range of stuff um, and it makes, makes it more accessible to communities with varying levels of technology expertise. And I love that about the workshop, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and the fact that they were, they took it virtual this year, this was new for them. Um, and, you know, they attracted over 800 people um, as registrants, which is huge, right? So that shows the demand for this technology at all of these different levels. So, so yes, I, I, I think this is, you know, what, what Steve and, and his Firelight group has done is, has really could be a model for capacity building for indigenous peoples definitely in the future. Well, thank you for uh, stepping in for Steve. Uh, somebody better wake that guy up. Uh, right. He's got work to do here. Uh, he's, he's probably too tired of all that work he's doing. <laughs> well, thank you again, Cindy. And thank you, everybody, uh, for this set part of the session. Uh, again, thank you for sharing your work again. And so we're going to move into the lightning. I want to say the lightning round, but that sounds, that's not right. <laughs> but the lightning talks. And so uh, we just have a great uh, group of folks here that's going to share uh, their lightning talk. So let's begin with uh, Nina Kacheva Tushev. I apologize for my pronunciation here. Uh, she's a co-founder of, of Tish, Tishev's Aerials, Senior Policy Advisor for Indigenous Peoples and Local Community Engagement, Global Program for Nature for Development. The title of her talk is Using Drones for Monitoring and Mapping Indigenous Territories. With that, please share Nina's video. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. What inexpensive tool can fight deforestation, help manage fires, plant trees, and deliver vaccines and pizza? If you set a drone, you got it. Drones are effective, affordable, portable tools for conservation. They're also a key piece in the longstanding puzzle of how best to support indigenous peoples, local communities, and other stakeholders to fight climate change, species extinction, and inequality. Ranging from remote control delta wings, like the one I have here on the screen and I'm showing, to off-the-shelf craft, to fully DIY custom-built multi-rotors, I'm showing you one as well, that can launch straight from a canoe, drones provide a bird's eye view of the world. Despite their usefulness in mapping and monitoring forests and biodiversity, drones are not yet widely available to indigenous peoples and local communities. It's time to change that. Lands owned by indigenous peoples have some of the richest carbon stocks in the world and are home to over 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. But these lands face tremendous pressure, including from infrastructure development, illegal logging, oil and gas production, land encroachment, and poaching. We have seen examples from UNDP's Equator Prize winners of communities using drones to fight deforestation, engage with local governments on co-management, even avoid contact with peoples living in voluntary isolation. Here's an example from the Peruvian rainforest of community monitors using drones, GPS, cell phones, and satellite data to successfully eliminate illegal deforestation on their territory. With drone-generated data in hand, indigenous peoples and local communities can seek redress and decide how to engage to localize existing spatial tools. One such tool is the UN Biodiversity Lab that we have developed at UNDP with partners. 
an open source platform with more than 130 spatial data layers that allows communities to make sense of satellite data, gain insights into trends, and contribute to a wider picture. In partnership with Impact Observatory, NASA, and others, we're helping governments develop maps of essential life support areas. These maps can help national decision makers protect, manage, and restore key areas to achieve biodiversity, climate, and sustainable development targets. Indigenous peoples need to be part of this process as they're crucial to reaching these goals. Democratizing drone technology and spatial data literacy are scalable solutions that enable communities to leverage inexpensive technology to strengthen their negotiating power in the fight for their rights and for the protection of their lands and resources. It's the least we can do for the life-giving stewardship they provide for the benefit of us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to go through the lightning talks and then at the end we'll uh, we'll do questions just in in terms of time. So our, our next talk will be Luke Zuertes. I apologize again for the pronunciation. He's a researcher and teacher assistant at Ghent University. The title of his talk is Adapting Educational Research Tools to Strengthen the Livelihood of the Maya Local Communities. Please play the video, Rick. I'd like to propose a project ID where using GeoTools, we can strengthen the livelihood of the Maya local communities in empowering their own future. Mayas are living in the Maya tropical forest, which is the second largest tropical forest in America, with large uh, sites of historical and cultural heritage, uh, like Temples of Palenque, Calakmul, Uxmal, City of Campeche, the Biosphere Reserve of Sian Kayan, and many more to be discovered, like the map in the middle shows. And these temples attract lots and lots of tourists. But these tourists, we have two types of tourists. The first type is the mass tourist, who comes from the tourist bus, takes some selfies, stay there maybe two hours max, go back in the bus and wait for the rest of the group they are not really a potential interesting group for the local Maya population because they have the time pressure, they just come to have a selfie. And because these tourists are now the most important group, they don't bring benefits to the local population, where we see here that three quarters of the local population of the Mayas is living in moderate to extreme poverty compared to only 40% of the other population. But there's another group of tourists, a growing number. About 70% seems would like to spend some time inside the tropical forest, sharing experience with the Maya local communities. So we need, therefore, to create such a service for them so the people know what can be found. Because these tourists have a very high potential for the Maya population. So how can we capture elements in order to elaborate maps to offer the ecotourist, so that he knows where the local food or overnight place can be found, or where there's a camping site, or where there's unknown archaeology, or swimming in the cenote, or jungle biking. So how can they do this? Well, therefore, we need to ask the question, okay, is the area interesting enough to attract beach, uh, tourists? We have to acquire such a point, take pictures, we have to explore information for people to get there, analyze the data, create finally a map, and then share the map with people. And this is using a kind of research data flow. We propose a very complex architecture, but very simple for the end user. They have to download first the data acquired by the local community at the INA office. And this map, this can be taken offline and you can add extra information, you can capture data, add extra data as well. Then you can discuss the final results you have, create IDs, propose solutions to the people, go back to Ina Ushmal office and finally create a map. Information the map comes from 
a WebGIS database which also takes use of satellite images. We can learn people how to work with these satellite images. And the capturing on the spot is using mobile devices, very simple uh, surveys that help them to really map all interesting places for the local people and for the tourists. And this could be kind of desired output, a map showing information of where you can have local food, where you can have bike rides and pictures showing interesting spots to visit. This is the proposal. Thank you for the attention. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Luke, for that um, for that presentation. We're going to uh, keep moving along here in our lightning talks, and I hope to have uh, time at the end so we could open it up for questions for us. Again, use Slido, use Slido.com, uh, Geo and Digital Summit keyword uh, to get your questions to our lightning talks. Our next speaker will be Alyana Horodovsky, postdoc at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. The title of her talk is Citizen Science with the Cocoraz Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. With that, please show Olyana's video. Thank you, Rick. Hi, everyone. My name is Olyana Hordiski, and I'm a postdoc at the Alaska Climate Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Today, I wanted to talk to you about citizen science opportunities with the Cocoraz Network. Uh, and Cocoa stands for Community, Collaborative, Rain, Hail, and Snow. So what exactly is Cocoa Ross? Well, its headquarters is in Fort Collins, Colorado, and it's this national grassroots effort. It's a nonprofit, uh, community-based network that's really trying to collect high-quality data and high-density data uh, precipitation in all its forms, from rain to snow to hail. And it's made up of uh, volunteers of all ages and backgrounds. And these people take daily measurements uh, of precipitation uh, right in their own backyards. But once trained, uh, volunteer observers collect data using low-cost measurement tools. And you can see some of these pictured here. You have these, these high-capacity rain gauges with the inner tube, aluminum foil wrapped styrofoam hail pads, home-built snowboards. And the important thing is that there is training that is done at whatever state you happen to be in um, by local volunteer uh, coordinators. Uh, this is especially important uh, in order to assure accurate and high quality data. And so when these kinds <clears throat> of sessions are held, people can ask questions, they can go through these training slideshows and really understand how exactly uh, they'll be taking these measurements, what their responsibilities actually are. Uh, so if you navigate to the webpage, kokoras.org, and this is where volunteers can report their daily observations. So they can either use uh, the interactive website or they can also use uh, the mobile app on their smartphones. So essentially, this is what one of these forms looks like. So you'll put in your date and time, and then you'll actually be making measurements uh, from the rain gauge and any observation notes. And when it's that time of year or you're in a place where they're constantly getting a lot of snow, especially Alaska, there's options there to put in measurements for new snowfall. Uh, and then total snow and ice on the ground at the time of your observations. So why Kokoros? Well, precipitation is a really important value uh, to quantify. It's very useful for scientists and for folks working, obviously, at the National Weather uh, Service. It's highly variable also. And data sources are few. And a lot of these rain gauges, unfortunately, are quite far apart. So there's really a lot of data gaps that need to be filled in nationwide, uh, and especially now Alaska, where Kokoras has just recently uh, expanded its network. Now, measurements from many sources uh, are not always accurate, especially snow, and there's almost no quantitative data about hail. And the reports that people submit can actually save lives. Uh, if there happens to be a very heavy rain or snowfall event, there is an option to report that. It's a significant weather report on the website. And that report goes immediately uh, to the National Weather Service office. So the main focus of Kokoros is to provide not only quality precipitation data that volunteers uh, are collecting, but also educational opportunities to help that public better understand weather and climate, and especially climate change. Uh, to give you an idea, this is what the current, at the time of this recording, uh, continental U.S. data uh, looks like. So you have the values in precipitation here, color-coded. So take a look here at continental U.S. and how good we have uh, of a spread of data and then take a look at Alaska. 
So there's lots of gaps to fill in here, lots of opportunity. And here's the web page where you can actually get more specific uh, information. Uh, but just a few words on what could happen potentially in Alaska. Snowfall measurements are typically more difficult than rain. So it takes a little bit more time, a little more training. But these kinds of accurate measurements are extremely important, um, especially to us working at the Alaska Climate Research Center that are really trying to understand uh, how climate change is impacting uh, the areas around Alaska. And so these are some of the tools, the exact same thing. You use the rain gauge, but you remove the inner part to be able to collect snow. You train people on how to exactly measure the depth. And here's some of the folks already uh, that you can contact to get more information. So we have Martin is the state coordinator, uh, myself, Liana, and the assistant state coordinator. So there's our contact information. We have folks in Fairbanks, Anchorage, and the Southeast Panhandle. And we're currently looking for volunteers uh, for the Alaska Native Villages. It's extremely important for us to work with the local communities uh, to build trust, to build awareness, uh, to have that gain of knowledge and feel like they're contributing uh, information that could be used uh, to understand really how Alaska is changing. I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Oliana. Again, we'll uh, take questions uh, at the end of our last lightning talk. Thank you for that presentation. Our next speaker will be Olivia Lee, Assistant Professor, University of Alaska Fairbanks. The talk of her talk, the talk the title of her talk is Sharing Observations of Coastal Arctic Alaska Change. Please show the video. Thank you. Hello, I'm Olivia Lee, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues on the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub about sharing observations of coastal Arctic change. Alaska Arctic Observatory allows community partners to share information about local travel conditions and weather, wildlife observed, ocean conditions, including coastal water temperatures, salinity and productivity, and in some communities, efforts to map ice thickness over whaling trails, and look at coastal erosion. A separate part of AAOKH is also K-12 education and outreach. The Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub relies on partnerships with our community observers who provide observations of coastal change. Our observers are located currently in the communities of Kaktovik, Wikiagvik, Point Hope, Wainwright, Kotzebue, and Wales. Also involved with AAOKH are a science steering team and a, a steering group, which includes community partners who are experts that help to guide the direction for this observing network. The observations are archived in a database that is supported by the National Science Foundation. There are two user levels. One is a guest access, which has mostly summarized information and not the full text of the observations, and a registered user account that does provide the full text of local observations. This protects any sensitive information from being widely available just to any member of the public. However, in both cases, any use of the database requires a user to agree to the terms of appropriate use of data from the observation database. Finally, in order to share information as widely as possible with community members across the AOKH community network, we share information on our Facebook page, which has over 1,400 users. But we do remind our Facebook page users that any information or photos posted by observers on the AOKH Facebook page may not be used for other purposes without getting permission from AOKH as well. And we mail printed newsletters to all the mailbox holders in the AOKH communities. Finally, if you have any other questions, you may contact me or Donna Hauser, who is the science lead for the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Our, our final presentation for the Lightning Talks uh, will be um, Anna Pradis, Research Associate Professor at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. The title of her talk is Online Training in Earth Observations 
for Indigenous Peoples Land Management. Please play your video. This project is a collaboration between the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program and Conservation International. So the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program is a NASA-funded program that has been around since 2009 to provide cutting-edge remote sensing education through both online and in-person training. This training is offered in a variety of formats and it covers a variety of satellites, sensors, and applications at various levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced. Roughly, we do our trainings in these four areas, and our materials are freely available in English and Spanish through our website. This slide shows the growth of our program over the last 12 years. As you can see in the loop, uh, our participation has been increasing steadily over the years with more and more countries joining in. A uh, total of 50,000 participants and almost 10,000 organizations. In addition to that, we've had participation from 85 tribal nations. So how does RSA develop a training? First, we define the user needs. Users can be people, organizations, or nations who could benefit from Earth observations. We work very much with regional collaborators. We identify the relevant data, and we teach how to access the data, how to analyze it with tools, and how to use it for environmental monitoring, management, and communications. And we do this largely through hands-on exercises that are tailored to their regional needs. There was a training we did recently that was specific to Earth observations for indigenous peoples land management. It was a collaboration between RSED and a NASA-funded Conservation International project that you can learn more about by listening to Karen Tabor's presentation. We integrated the RSED training expertise with Conservation International's expertise in conservation management and work with indigenous communities. It covered mapping, GIS drones, and participatory mapping in a storytelling format. There were 47 tribal nations who attended and 10 indigenous advocacy organizations. And it was disseminated in English and in Spanish. So what's next? We'd love to work with you to reach more indigenous communities and also include indigenous voices in our training planning and to increase awareness of our freely available ARSA resources. And here is information on how to connect with me or the RSET program. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, for that, that, that great presentation. Uh, now let's get into some questions for our, our Lightning Talk speakers. So Lightning Talk speakers, can you please turn on your cameras? Uh, the first question is for Luke. Yes. Um, Luke, Hello. Luke, thank yeah. you again for your talk. How, question, how have you worked with indigenous communities to ensure their needs are being met? Um, yeah. Have they given their permission for their yes. lands to be mapped? Yeah, well, just make sure to say mapping, the idea is in fact, it's an idea. I don't know if my colleagues, uh, Philip, I know is online also. I don't know if Mario Hernandez is also online because Mario is our contact person who is in fact from Mexico himself. Um, the idea is in fact that we got the question where we were in Campeche we were in uh, contact with people, uh, with colleagues from uh, the Maya community. And the idea was, how can we benefit more of the tourism? So in fact, what they would like to do is to, to map the locations surrounding the temples, which are, of course, the main attract attractions for the tourists. Uh, how could they get uh, to see more to the tourists, so more information of what's available that could benefit for the local population? There was one idea, and the other idea was also that something we we're doing now with education is how can we um, try to get the people more uh, involved in decision making. Uh, you know maybe about the Maya uh, train. There's a project which is, um, in fact, kind of a, a project which is uh, um, 
done by uh, mostly the president of, of Mexico, he's in favor of it, to recreate a train line on the Maya, Penins uh, the Maya Peninsula. But of course, the location of that train is mostly seen from the point of view of the tourism and not to benefit the local population. And also that trajectory is going through areas where still a lot of undiscovered uh, uh, Maya uh, temple sites. So the idea is, can we, one way or the other, by using these tools, by giving access to the LiDAR data and, and other imagery, uh, get the people into touch, meaning we get to, uh, first we have to give the information to schools, how to learn to work with all this uh, information, and then let the people also get involved in decision making. That's the main purpose about it. Okay. Thank you, Luke. I'd like to come back to you on that, another follow-up, but uh, also wanted to bring other folks into this conversation. I have a question about Coca Ross. I, I am aware of the Coca Ross program, this is for Oyana. Oyana, uh, can you please share uh, further of how maybe citizen science, you know, GEO has this big citizen science effort program. Uh, what are your thoughts on how, you know, we can enhance your program or how can we better support your program? Or even the question is, you know, how do we think about more indigenous uh, participation in the Coco Ross program? Absolutely. So I uh, just got involved with this project starting in August. Um, so I'm actually from Colorado. And so that's oh. where Coco Ross started. Um, right. And then I found out about the initiative to um, introduce it into Alaska. Because as you can see from the image I showed, it's really um, just in Fairbanks, Anchorage, and uh, the Panhandle right now. And so we really want to be working um, in the villages, working with natives. My experience comes from working with local communities uh, in Nepal as well as Baffin Island. So it's a very a big component for me to be able to work with local communities because that's what we're trying to, uh, to do here is to build this community uh, to be able to... Um, to understand more about the climate changes because it's up in the north and the western parts of the state are, are seeing incredible changes just in the last few years. And so there's a way to empower communities to collect this information. And so being new to all this, um, I've been attending these kinds of summits and conferences and thank you for the opportunity uh, to meet people to see how this can be done in collaboration. You know, I, I, I'm kind of aware of the Coca Ross program. I know it's a sort of a low cost ideas to make it low cost, make it more accessible to communities. Uh, you know, what, what are your guys' next plans? Is there funding associated with Coca Ross in terms of data collection? I know you have to pay for the, the module or the container to collect that stuff, but is there any uh, new ideas or things going forward that maybe the Geo Indigenous Alliance can, can help support, help facilitate going forward? Great question, because we're actually in the midst of trying to do the fundraising for it. So uh, the, the program itself is sponsored by NOAA and the National Science Foundation, um, but communities do have to provide the funds to, to buy the equipment, which could be a deterrent. So we absolutely want to raise the money to be able to, um, to buy the equipment um, and to outsource to the communities. So we are in the midst of writing some grants uh, for that, and I would love to be in touch with you about ways moving forward okay. to joint write these things. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that you. opportunity. I, I want to do um, go to go to Nina. Uh, I, I I love the drone imagery. Uh, what you showed with us. I you know I'm a I love how you know the idea of thinking about drones, the role of drones now going forward, and and how they could support uh, indigenous people. You know your your uh, your title is interesting to me, senior policy advisor. Um, can you share a little bit more about um, how your work, uh, your position, um, wh what's happening in terms of maybe po the policy side of this work uh, in terms of data, uh, data yeah. access, data privacy, data protection, and how that works and interfaces with indigenous communities. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that, um, James, and thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. So that title is at UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, and um, I've been working with uh, UNDP for for the past several uh, past several years, because I'm very interested in that linkage with policy. Exactly how can we ensure that the data that indigenous peoples produce can affect policy? And 
throughout my, my career, I've been interested in opening up political space for indigenous peoples to negotiate on their own behalf and advocate on their own behalf. So that I continue to do that at um, UNDP. My job is to make sure that indigenous peoples and local communities are engaged in the political process. And we're just now starting to explore how we can um, use spatial data respecting principles of indigenous data sovereignty um, to affect policy. Right now, as you know, the UN works with, with governments, but we also have a duty and um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples have, mm -hmm. has been adopted. So we are like, the way I think of the UN is we're the good conscience of governments. <laughs> and that's, that's in the best case scenario, right? Yes, right, right. So we can't just uh, work with governments only. Um, we, we work with Indigenous peoples, and that's my role there, to be an ally to Indigenous communities within the organization. We award the Equator Prize, and that's how we identify a lot of best practices around the world in uh, biodiversity conservation and climate change. Um, that's kind of our constituency. We also host the New York Declaration on the Forest, which is a voluntary agreement of 10 goals to stop deforestation that governments, corporations, indigenous peoples, NGOs have signed. So it, my effort and what I want to do is, is reach out and connect with groups like yours, like GEO Indigenous Alliance, and uh, the Equator Prize winners and the endorsers of the New York Declaration and other indigenous communities to make sure that we build a strong process that it respects indigenous data sovereignty and can affect policy. Right now, we've been, our spatial work, we've been supporting governments to use better spatial maps and data to make better decisions around biodiversity, for example. But I want to make sure that indigenous peoples have access to the same and we're able to uh, to assist in that way, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, I wanna go to Olivia. Olivia, uh, thank you again for your, your talk. And, you know, I, 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 I've been sort of tracking this uh, indigenous leadership initiative in, in Canada, really looking at this idea, because we're talking about capacity building, education, intergenerational knowledge of transfer um, among indigenous people. Uh, can you, uh, to share a little bit more about, um, is there any linkages with your work and the I-L-A-L-L, I-L-I, or, um, you know, really understanding, you know, this idea of of knowledge transfer? Uh, I'm really, we're really interested in that idea at geo Indigenous Alliance because we know that, uh, you know, we have uh, tremendous vulnerabilities in our, our knowledge holders community, our elders, and especially with COVID, you know, these issues are really coming to the forefront. And so we're thinking about, you know, and, and one of the reasons for this session was to identify those who were doing this kind of work. And uh, so I wanted to see and, and ask you, uh, what's what's your current thinking? Uh, what are things like that that are can be helpful for us as a community here, a geo indigenous community to better understand uh, how we do this work and how we do it well? Because I know there's so many, so many needs, so many things, but you know, what can you tell us today about how we go go best forward working um, indigenous communities around these issues like education, like capacity building, like intergenerational knowledge transfer? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, you know, we haven't really been that involved with the Geo Indigenous Alliance, so I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with with new collaborators. Um, what's been what we've learned, at least in our small world in, in Northern Alaska is we started out with a very simple researcher community um, relationship. And we worked a lot with, with elders. And since then, quite a few of our elders have passed away. And now we work with a um, younger generation of hunters who are still actively out on the land. And what's been great is because we've been able to preserve the, you know, in text, the, the observations from our elders and, and and the vocabulary that's being used that's still preserved for, for future generations to access at any point in time. What we're doing now too is, you know, we're, we're making sure that we keep the high resolution images that are shared um, so that, you know, the, the landscape is changing so quickly. So even five, 10 years down the road, future generations can go back and compare what their predecessors have, have been observing in terms of change. Again, you know, as much as we can in terms of allowing our community collaborators to share whatever aspect of, 
Arctic coastal change that they want to using um, traditional la knowledge, language. We don't, we don't have a fixed form that says we only are interested in these specific aspects. Please just share with us whatever it is you like, whether it's a long story or a short one. That way, um, hopefully, this database gets preserved and, and future generations can access that knowledge system from, from their elders and so forth um, at any point in time. So um, that's just the little bit of knowledge that we've gained from just this small project. Well, thank you. And, you know, I guess part of, you know, my understanding and, and my involvement with GEO, you know, it started about a year ago. And so, but I have some background in remote sensing and those kind of things. So that I'm, I'm really excited to see the progress uh, and, and seeing how you all here are working with Indigenous people. And the question I, we always ask is, is, is you know, how is that growing in terms of our understanding and our knowledge so that when we talk about Indigenous people, you know, when we talk about them, it's, it's with them, right? It's not about them. And so these models of collaboration is really important as we go forward. I um, I had a question for, um, you know, for, for, for Anna. Anna, you shared uh, your presentation. You presented a lot of data on the where your training has gone, uh, the role of online. Uh, can you share with us again uh, what what you think uh, is sort of the next big thing? Is there, a, if there's, is there a big thing in online training around these things? Uh, what do we need to do together to help support your efforts, to support our efforts here to really what, what I'm looking at really is building indigenous uh, leadership in GEO uh, through capacity building, through education, through training. So um, are there any big ideas that you can share with us or, or or next step ideas that we can help understand better so that we can support each other? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. So, uh, you know, we started the online training uh, 10 years ago. Uh, because of the difficulties with the in-person training, right? It was so costly for people to get to, to 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 locations, particularly, and I like to say we've done a lot of our in-person trainings have actually been in Latin America. Um, and uh, in Latin America, we worked very hard to add language to our trainings that mm. made more sense, you know, so, so we have about a third of our, of our trainers are bilingual. Uh, we've, uh, and I know it's been very helpful for the indigenous communities in Latin America, including university students who take our courses where English is just not an option. Uh, so we've done a lot with language, but you know, we still, although we've mostly gone online and it is not as, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's the good and the bad about online, right? You can access more people, um, but it's, it's a little more challenging to make it regional, regi regionally relevant. Um, so, so I think we welcome others in joining us in even making even these online trainings more regionally relevant. Um, ours tend to be huge; they tend to be global, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? And we could take our right. experience from doing these classroom trainings and bring it to the on online experience, uh, make it more regional and more diverse as well. Um, so, I think. I think uh, we need to continue the online, but take what we know and what's working with the classroom experience and integrate it fully into that. The online thank experience. You. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that for that answer. You know, as we get close to, um, we got 10 minutes left in this session, I wanted to just um, ask you all here, um, you know, the question I have, you know, from my opinion in, in, in thinking about, you know, this idea about education and, and generational transfer and and how do we do that work? You know, there's a, you know, there's always there's a large community of indigenous people, right? And and we respect the diversity of each culture and who they are and sort of where they want to go to. So I would ask each one of you, if you would just uh, give me um, your thoughts um, about, so how do we go forward? Um, how do we go forward with this? Um, is, is there a next step from your perspective that together with the Geo Indigenous Alliance and Geo and our partners, how do we um, how do we create uh, a more effective, if that's a good word, more effective indigenous leaders, uh, young adults, young people? Um, you know, do we need a, is there a curriculum that needs to be developed? For instance, um, do we need a, you know a, a model? Do we need a, you know resourced? 
uh, to do this work more? Um, you know, what's the year ahead look like for us that we, what we should be thinking about and how we go forward? So let me start with you, Luke, and then we'll just go down the line here. Well, from my point of view, um, I think we should be focusing mostly on the secondary school education, so the high school education, if we could try to get it into that education already on, on a better level, uh, where people get more uh, used to use these uh, geo tools, that will be the first step, I think. Because if I look now, um, we have this contact with people from uh, Campeche region, and indeed the problem there is uh, how will we let these people work with these tools, as most of the schools have a very bad uh, equipment from point of view of, of computers and ICT. So the first uh, barrier to take is to make sure that the basic requirements are met. And I think once we can start from the secondary school level on, it will be much easier to continue to get people involved uh, using these tools. Thank you. Olivia? Um, yeah, I agree. Being able to provide tools is, is great. And in, um, unfortunately, remote Alaska communities, that internet connectivity is still an issue. So until, you know, we're able to provide both tools and effective, cost-effective internet access, it's difficult for all these remote trainings um, to, to really build capacity in some of these remote communities. Um, but I also am really optimistic because we've seen a lot of the youth finding their voice and being given a platform um, to talk to decision makers. And so I, I think that the youth are, are kind of leading the way themselves in terms of showing that they have that capacity already and that leadership skill. So I, I really am optimistic that um, as long as we continue to give them that platform to, to give them their voice, that, that they'll, they'll, they'll tell us what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Oliana. Yeah, so looking at the year ahead, uh, I definitely think uh, curriculum development is, uh, is a big portion of it. I'm coming at it, obviously, from the Kokoros perspective, but uh, identifying local leaders uh, in these communities, because again, we want to be in collaboration. We want um, the local communities to be uh, at the forefront of, of, of this. So I think being able to do obviously training in person uh, when it's possible again after the pandemic. But meanwhile, having these kinds of virtual get togethers has been extremely useful. And I really enjoyed the, the CQU project. So I was thinking something along the lines <laughs> of what if we also had some kind of like a network where we're sharing um, the curriculum from all these different kinds of, of projects and seeing what that common ground is and how we can build out from there. Very good, thank you. Nina? Yes, thank you so much for asking that question, um, James. That's that's really excellent. I see that um, I'd like to have another conversation with the group here because I really would like to understand what has already been done. On the one hand, I know that Conservation International and NASA have done some needs assessment and trainings. You have done trainings, Firelight Group. So just kind of do a little bit of a mapping of what has already been done uh, and figure out what, what are the next steps I'm interested in helping um, move this uh, towards a policy change and how do we get um, the data to make a difference in terms of policy. So on the one hand, we also at our program have a learning platform called Learning for Nature, uh, where we host MOOCs and self-paced courses. We have a course on the UN Biodiversity Lab. So I want to understand what's the role of us to continue producing these capacity building uh, materials and what's the role of the GEO Indigenous Alliance, for example, and groups like Firelight and all of the participants here. So understanding that, understanding how to do a needs assessment with, let's say, with the Equator Prize winners, we know we have about 275 communities from around the world, um, the, the, the declaration endorsers. So just understanding what the needs are so that we can we can really fine tune the, the capacity building programs and then having a conversation of how that's how we go. What are the paths to changing policy to making sure that that data can contribute to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the post-2020 framework is being negotiated in 2021, and also to the UNFCCC, to the climate change negotiations. Great. Wow, that's you. great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Anna? 
your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I, I like what, what was said earlier about, you know, we have all these training programs, right? And so we might be able to, it would be interesting to think if, you know, if it would make sense to leverage some of each other's educational materials. I know, for example, in the case of the remote sensing data, uh, we'd love to be able to bring some of the ground measurements to those trainings, right? It makes a lot more sense in the context of the, the, the local ground-based data. So, you know, we might be able to put something together, uh, put together something together, sorry, that, uh, that, that, is, that is basically that it's, that's, yeah. you know, that's to, to, to take us forward. Um, in addition to that, you know, one of the challenges from the NASA perspective is there's so much data, right? And every year there's more, right? So I, I, one of my big challenges is prioritizing what we're going to teach, right? And we're definitely not bringing the indigenous voices into this right now. And I would like to work with the Alliance on doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, should we, it's not just a resolution. Some of it are global. Sometimes, as an example, you can get something that gives you good spatial coverage, but then the temporal coverage isn't as good. What's more important? You know, I, I love to, you know, learn from others. I need to learn about what, what is, what are some of the key data sets that we should be prioritizing. Thank you. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for that. And, you know, as we uh, wrap up, let me just uh, say some closing comments for this session. Again, thank you um, all for being here with us today, uh, just sharing uh, your work and um, I would say your commitment and passion to supporting indigenous people, in particular, the youth. I think um, your emphasis and your interest in working with our youth is uh, is important. And I think the Indigenous Alliance, as we begin to build a foundation of what we can do together, um, is, is gonna be really built on this idea of capacity building in youth. Um, you know, as we also wrap up, I know you, you offer some good questions. What can the Indigenous Alliance do or what should we do? And so we're gonna have an event summary report from this uh, summit to go out so you're on our email list now, you cannot get off it. Uh, you're stuck with us now, whether you want to or not. <laughs> but it, it's great to, to be connected like this with you all. And um, so let me just say that, thank you again, and uh, stay stay involved. Keep, encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because uh, it, it, it does make a difference. Uh, whether, uh, whether we know about it or not, uh, certainly uh, our indigenous communities um, would recognize that. So um, as we wrap up again, thank you again. And so our next session is gonna start in, in a half hour, 30 minutes. I forget, I, I get stuck on this European time stuff. So I'm not used to your CET. Stephen Ramaj is always giving me a hard time about not understanding CET, but um, be ready for that. Thank you again for the session and uh, look forward to a, a event summary from us as we continue to build this great community of geo-indigenous so thank you very much and take care thank and you. be safe thank yeah you. be safe thank you everybody. everybody nice to meet you Bye. thank you so much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.